Good afternoon again. Uh, this talk is about uh, simulation of uh, architecture using. We can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, using uh, the chiplet solutions uh, to address the bottlenecks in the AI chips. So uh, initially I thought I have um, maybe 30 minutes, but it ends up to be like, like 20 minutes. So I tried to go quickly through uh, the, the, some of the obvious, <laughs> that the, the fact that um, bandwidth uh, to memory and other chips are really the bottleneck. Over the past two decades, Moore's law and so forth has helped the compute performance to go almost five orders of magnitude higher, but the bump pitch of the packages and the speed of those uh, bumps hasn't gone up that much, maybe only 30x. So there's a huge delta between the two, and that's why we have a real bottleneck uh, of memory bandwidth and I.O. bandwidth, which is called memory I.O. wall. And on top of that, of course, the power supplying the, uh, megawatts of power to these uh, Compute pods is another major problem that you know, different hyperscalers are planning to build uh, these nuclear plants to supply that the power. And uh, considering that about one third of the power in these uh, data centers are an interconnect, that again kind of shows that why interconnect becomes a major problem and why chiplet solutions, in fact, address all of these uh, challenges you know, by removing the package, connecting them together at very high density bumps instead of balls, which is order of magnitude more or so, and uh, connecting them with uh, very simple channels, which means low power, high bandwidth, it addresses all these uh, bottlenecks altogether. But of course, it needs more innovation. As you see, uh, people have been using chiplets, mainly in the form of DRAM and compute, and uh, this has been around uh, for the last few years. But uh, I still think there is, uh, uh, still a bottleneck uh, as we speak. We are using uh, HBM as a way to provide terabytes of, uh, per second of bandwidth to the memory compute, so to the compute chip. But if you consider Blackwell as an example, it has 10,000 teraflops, uh, which for a uh, uh, FP8. And given the memory bandwidth of HBM, the eight HBMs it has, it's eight terabytes per second. So what it means is that Effectively, it has uh, 1,200 flops per byte of operation. But once you consider the AI models, they're typically, uh, the typical arithmetic intensity they have is in uh, 10 to 100, uh, which means, you know, in, for those models, Blackwell are, is utilized maybe around 10%. But even for arithmetic intensity of 500, is, uh, consumes the, the processor itself, the AI, the GPUs, basically utilize less than 50%. So what it says is that there is still a lot more room to provide this higher bandwidth rather than providing higher performance in the GPUs. And maybe that's why Blackfold you know, ended up at five nanometer and not seven nanometer. But of course, the industry is going towards building bigger and bigger uh, chip solutions uh, with large substrates, 10 reticle, putting a lot of these chiplets together with a lot of memory and optical uh, interfaces. and that's the way to go, but uh, at the end of the day, we are still limited by the beachfront of these um, processor chiplets, and that's uh, something to, that we need to address. But kind of starting from the technologies today, what people are using to connect and build these chiplets. So it's been silicon interposer, one big substrate of silicon connecting these chiplets together, but those are, their size is limited to about three reticle. Going beyond that, people are moving to silicon bridges, whether it's inside a mold like Covacel or EMIB in an organic substrate. And these are great tools to get larger substrates. Still, the silicon interfaces uh, provide the high bandwidth density, high wire count between the chiplets and provide um, the necessary bandwidth that is required. But uh, it also comes with some challenges, meaning once these uh, silicon bridges are placed, they have to be very accurately placed from each other, as opposed to silicon interposer, COVAS, that is, uses one single mass to connect it, all self-aligned. The placement of these solutions should be very well aligned. And on top of this, the materials that is used, like the mold, has a significant higher CTE, thermal uh, expansion, four to five X more. So when these chips get really hot, it becomes a problem. And uh, I'm trying to show that problem to some extent here. First of all, 
if these bridges are not well aligned to the bumps. So these bumps, which are 20 micron wide and the bump pads are around the same. If they're, let's say, five to 10 microns off, the connections between them wouldn't be that strong. Now imagine that there is some expansion that this bottom one will expand much faster or much more than the other one. They can easily break these bumps. Of course, this is not an issue for the central ones because the expansion will not affect it, but the bridges on the other one will have more impact of this. And some of the issues maybe you have heard about Blackwell recently is related to that as well. Of course, some people try to also address the bandwidth issue to the memory by putting the HBM DRAM on top of the processor or the high, high compute processor chip. This is a nice idea because it gives you 3D bandwidth and significant bandwidth, but at the same time, DRAM is very temperature sensitive. So you have to make sure that the area underneath it, which is not small, 150 millimeters squared roughly, you're not burning too much power, meaning you're not using it for too much compute because it will corrupt the data in DRAM. So it won't be a good use of your two or three nanometer chip as a result. So it's still the preferred approach to put them on the side and then connect them together with some very efficient tools. So a combination of 3D to two, two and a half D hybrid solution still continues to be the better option. This slide, I'm not going to spend too much time to just give you a high level idea of uh, different uh, terminologies for D2D5. UCIE is a standard that has basically, we call it fixed unidirectional, TX connected to one lane, RX one lane is fixed. BOW, they try to con address some flexibility in connectivity. So if you have, a, like say, IO chiplet, you don't have to plan ahead and you want to sell it to multiple people. You, ha you have it configurable that you can decide later whether these are lanes are transmit or receive. The two new ones that we introduced, we call it dynamic bidirectional and simultaneous bidirectional. Simu dynamic bidirectional means that TX and RX connect to the same lane and they can transmit or receive uh, one at a time, just like a memory interface, read or write. This solution is ideal for internet memory interfaces. Then simultaneous bidirectional, you can simultaneous read and write. So this effectively, this bidirectional approach will double the capacity of the interfaces, which is key. For example, let's say you have 32 gig uh, transceivers and uh, you want to have 320 uh, links or 320, uh, sorry, gigabits per second between two chips. In, let's say in a UCIE approach, you need 10 lines for RX, 10 lines for TX. So that's 20 lanes. But if you have this bidirectional approach, where you can share lanes effectively with 10 wires or 10 links, you can get the same 320 gigabit per second uh, that you target. So this bidirectional approach gives you a lot, you know, easily 2x efficiency in terms of bandwidth efficiency on the beachfront of these chips. And these are the things that we have been trying to leverage. Like um, starting from back in 2017 and 18, uh, the idea of using bidirectional things for die-to-die -die interface came around, it's, uh, uh, I started building them in silicon up to 28 gig, uh, took it to uh, OCP, uh, it became the basis for BOW, and this is a very solid technology that has been used in industry, has been uh, shipped in multi-million uh, units of uh, products so far, chiplet products. But then we also expanded it into higher speed, into five nanometer, four nanometer, up to 40 gig, and then the most recent one is the three nanometer that goes up to 64 gig that uh, we have and the show floor that uh, you can uh, visit us and leverages the bi-directional uh, technology. And it gives you, of course, very high bandwidth efficiency, both in a standard package and also advanced package all the way up to 20 terabits per millimeter. I'm not going to spend too much time on this table. I'll just give you like a state of the market. The fastest silicon die to die goes up to 24 gig uh, per link, leveraging the 64 gig, whether in standard package or advanced package, you can do the comparison of the advantages that you get in either case. But one of the key things that um, since inception of Elian we've been trying to preach uh, to the industry was changing the base die of uh, the HBM as a memory to some higher performance process. By doing so, you can do a lot more interesting thing in the base die. Up to so far, the base die, which has the phi, which is the high power portion of the HPM, is using DRAM, which is a very slow process. 
By changing that, you can do a lot of interesting things. So finally, Samsung last year announced that they bought into that vision that they're going to do this, and SK Hynix and Micron followed. And today, you can effectively custom design your base die in form of an ASIC, and then have uh, one of these memory guys integrate it uh, fully as a, they call it custom HBM, and sell it to you as a known good uh, HBM or die. And one of the things, of course, you can do is, because now you have a high performance FinFET as a base die, you can implement one of these advanced die-to-die -die files in the base die, which means you can run every bump much faster, four times to eight times faster, and therefore do without the using silicon interposer advanced packaging, at least for interconnecting HPM. And it, uh, of course, these solutions, we are trying to not to keep it proprietary. We have proposed it to JEDEC as SPHPM and at OCP as, as, as UMI. The only difference is in JEDEC, the memory controller sits on the ASIC, as UMI memory controller sits on the base die. And this shows one example advantages that uh, you may use silicon bridge to connect the two compute ASICs together, but you don't have to extend it to the HPM. So eliminates the problem that I mentioned earlier because, because of thermal expansion and so forth. So leveraging that concept effectively, you can say, take a black well, just limited the silicon interposer to the, HP, to the compute ASIC and put all the HPMs off, off of it. And in fact, build something that is twice as big as black well, but with a smaller silicon interposer and therefore having higher yield. But of course, you can do more interesting things as a part of uh, having an HPM based die that uses FinFET. And one of those things is having a multi-port uh, base die HPM. What it means is that because now you have an advanced die to die phi at the bottom, you can get a lot more bandwidth than your HPM needs within the same beachfront. So you can use that excess bandwidth for many other reasons. Like one example of it would be simply put another HPM and connect it to, through this uh, to the ASIC. So that means through the same beachfront, you have effectively connected two HPMs. Uh, for example, if, if you have HPM4 today, and we know every generation of HPM gives you 2x bandwidth effectively and 2x capacity. By daisy chaining two HPM4s, you get like a HPM5 capacity and bandwidth today, leveraging this solution. But of course, this is not just limited to expanding for um, memory or HPM. You can use this excess, excess bandwidth for other purposes, meaning connecting CERTES on the other side, or co-package optics as an example or even embed the CERTES inside the base die. So you don't necessarily use some external CERTES triplets on the other side, or like, let's say LPDDR, PHI, and so forth to expand the memory capacity that you have. So this memory can act as a cache, and you have a much bigger memory on the outside. But the key point here is that so far, when you put HPM against a certain shoreline, that shoreline was gone. The bandwidth you could get from that shoreline was completely used out by HPM. And knowing that how important bandwidth is effectively, this multiple HPM will solve that problem, meaning you still, on the other side of this HPM, get the high bandwidth that you could apply for other applications here as well. So leveraging that idea, let's say you have a black wall. You stay with the same size uh, silicon interposer as black wall. You can have double HPMs on the other side. You can double them, and in fact, with this technology that we have and proposed, you can even go to HPM4, uh, two times HPM4 on every one of these uh, paths. But at the same time, also combined uh, the D2D that we offer on, let's say, 64 gig on a standard package, build something that has uh, much higher performance. Again, effectively 4 to 8x HPM and uh, 4 to, like, let's say, 4x more bandwidth between the CPUs uh, or GPUs in here. This is uh, actually, uh, Next Platform has written a nice article about this uh, architecture, and I've provided the link here for you to, if you want to read about it. So, so far I talked about uh, the die-to-die -die portion of the technology that we're doing, but this can be expanded to go off-chip as well, something which we call Newlink X, or somewhat equivalent to NVLink, if you want to call it, that uh, provides very high bandwidth, 
between the packages on the board, let's say about half a terabit to our next generation future would be up to one terabit per millimeter on the package edge, on the balls of the package, which are like typically 0.8 to one millimeter. But it, it's offered at a very low power. Effectively, the bandwidth efficiency you get out of it from the packages is similar to like a 200 gig series, but at significant lower power. Of course, the reach is not as significant, so it limits the applications, but for a number of applications that we see today, this has become very handy. Like, as an example, uh, you can use these uh, new link Xs or 200 gig switch to get bandwidth outside of a solution like Blackwell up to 10, 10 terabits per second, but just leveraging the two sides. If you connect it to like a near package optics, New Link X is good enough to achieve that same bandwidth, but at significantly lower power. But if you want to go to next generation, of course, to get double the bandwidth, let's say 20 terabits per millimeter, the approach you can take is go to like a 480 gig series, uh, which for those who are designing the 30s, uh, you know, that's, it's a very difficult, challenging solution. This can come up in the next, let's say, four or five years, people coming up with the 400 gig 30s, or go to co-package optics, which is, has its own uh, challenges, uh, as uh, some of you know. Like, a lot of people don't want to include the optics inside the same package as, let's say, GPU or AI ASIC because of the reliability issues that it has. But these are the existing solutions available. But I talked to you earlier about leveraging the base time HBM and using a multiple HBM. And one of the advantages that this can give you is exactly here. So rather than basically doubling the speed on the same edge, using the multiple HBM will give you the beach front that you typically lose on the other side of uh, the HBMs. So now you have the other two edges to transmit or receive, put 30s and uh, anything else, uh, whether it's a 220 gig 30s or a new link X, and then connect externally. And especially, for example, in this scenario, because this edge is in fact longer, uh, this edge, let's say, is 30 millimeter, this edge is like 45 millimeter, then you get two and a half X more bandwidth without having to go to the next generation 30s, going to co package optics and so forth. So with technology of today, you can get even more than double the bandwidth of something that you could get tomorrow. So as for us, call to action, um, of course, uh, we have started uh, the solution, the dynamic bi-directional of our technology, as I mentioned, called UMI at uh, OCP, it's called the two point, BOW 2.1, which uh, I'd like to get uh, the industry to get more involvement. Uh, we are driving the spec at uh, OCP right now, and the more we feedback we get from the industry and we hear about the features that you need, specifically for memory applications, uh, we can offer a solution to the industry that would be useful for majority, and uh, hopefully will be widely used there. And uh, in the summary, uh, so as I shared, uh, a combination of bi-directional die-to-die phi combined with these uh, multi-port custom HBM we can solve the, some of the major bottlenecks of the future AI chips, <coughs> calling the memory wall by extending the HPM memory, daisy chaining them, or going off chip to external memory, and also the uh, I.O. wall by enabling the other edge of the, these XPUs that so far has been blocked by HPM to be used for other purposes, such as connecting through SERDES or other interconnect outside and get much more bandwidth uh, externally with existing te technology. And of course, leveraging our new link X, especially for near new link optics, will provide a significant better advantage in terms of power and so forth. So that summarizes my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Rami. I have to rush, so. Yeah, that, that was a lot of information there. Um, I'm afraid we don't have time for questions, but feel free to Ramin, will you be here in the audience? Um, reach out to him for questions.